Good evening and welcome to the Capital Improvement Project Information Meeting. My name is Craig Tice. I'm the Superintendent of Schools at Fayetteville Manlius. And I'm delighted to be joined this evening by my co-presenters, which will include Dr. Ray Kilmer, our Executive Principal here at the high school, and Mr. Bill Furlong, our Assistant Superintendent for Business Services. We'll each take a portion of the presentation uh, this evening and then open it up for questions and answers at the end. And at that time, we may call upon a number of other individuals that chose to be with us this evening from our architectural firm, King & King Architects, from our construction management firm, LaChase uh, Construction, as well as our district office administrators. And we have two board of education members here from our facilities committee. So before we get into the slide deck and try to go through some of the anticipated questions that you might have, some of the things that are highlighted in either the infographic that was available out at the front desk or the district newsletter that was just mailed to residents, I think a picture is worth a thousand words and we will endeavor uh, to do that with a video that was put together by the Capital Region BOCES Communications Department here at school. So without further ado, I'll turn it over here. This is a project that has no fluff. This is a project that has no waste. Everything is essential and will have an impact on every student that walks through these doors. When you look at Fayetteville Manlius High School, it was designed for the purposes and functionality of the 1960s and the curriculum of the 1960s. This is what we call the, the underpass. And so we have a staff member that stands out here between every passing period. Morning. Morning, Dr. Kill. It takes students a very long time to get from one side of the building to the other. The connecting corridors were not designed to move 1,400 students all at the same time between the two buildings. And so what we have is, is we have students walking outside that create security concerns. That's one of the hallways to get students from house one to house two. One of the, the largest additions as a part of this project is a connecting corridor. Now, the connecting corridor isn't a hallway. Uh, it's actually an opportunity to build a student commons that will also be cafeteria, but more importantly, make the building feel more unified. Um, and then it also addresses those security concerns that we have. One piece that we desperately need is an ability to be able to serve and feed our students in a more efficient manner. See maximum occupancy, same sign that was probably hung in 1961 when it opened. We would have to start lunches at approximately 8.30 in the morning to get every single student to have a lunch if we even wanted to. This will provide some great flexibility and able to feed students, but also opens up the door for how we schedule. You want to make that pop. So one of the positives of this project is just trying to unify or centralize some services for students. All of our mental health counseling services will be in one location. Looking for an opportunity to consolidate all of these services into one area increases accessibility for students but also families. So parents, community members will have better, easier access ultimately to us. Original 1960 boilers. Talking about the HVAC system of the high school, we're talking about two completely different systems. You have inefficiencies in both systems, and unfortunately you don't have consistent air temperature, and so students are moving from hot and cold spaces. Of course, when you have those levels of inconsistencies, that impacts student learning. Students aren't always comfortable in those settings, and so providing a much more reliable, efficient system will be beneficial to students. Not to mention, it'll increase airflow throughout the whole facility, which of course, living in this COVID pandemic, is a positive because we know how much air circulation and air quality impacts our students. I saw it. Our technology rooms, they were designed in the 50s. It's when technology was known as wood shop. We don't have wood shop anymore, but we're still working in a facility that was designed for wood shop. So there's about 240 students coming through this facility in one day and it's just small. Because of the size of our studio, we've had students who have not been able to gain access to the courses. 
um, because we have had to cap the size at a certain amount. Unfortunately, you know, even beyond the quality of the work that the students are producing and how hard they're working, that the space just has not had the opportunity and the flexibility to grow with them. It's limiting the students because we can't do the projects that we would like to do. Like for example, this is an auto tech class that I'm teaching right now. And unless the weather's nice, we can't work on a car because we can't pull a car into our shop. If we could get a facility where we could house larger projects like that, it would really open up a lot of opportunities for our students. I think one of the most important things about the Capital Improvement Plan is that for the first time in the program's history, um, it will have its own space. It will have a space that's designed with the curriculum in mind. And our hopes is that we can continue to kind of expand those programs and, and use this space to the best of its ability. As far as tonight's meeting agenda is concerned, it's our intent to go through a number of different items that uh, have been posed using our Let's Talk communication portal. We'd like to talk about a review of the educational needs uh, that really was the impetus behind this project, a review of the needed infrastructure, renovations, and improvements. Dr. Kilmer will then walk us through the conceptual design and the preliminary phasing plan. And then finally, Mr. Furlong will give us the cost and tax impact for all of us, as well as an overview of the voting information. The vote will take place a week from tonight, a week from today, rather, at Fayetteville Elementary from 7 in the morning until 9 at night. And then we'll open it up to any questions from the audience. As far as the educational program needs, uh, they're certainly varied. We've surveyed faculty and administrators, and we worked hard to develop a conceptual design, as you can see, that allows for additional space, not only for the academic programs that have been improving and increasing in enrollment, such as broadcast journalism and technology, but also student services. Certainly the pandemic has weighed heavily on everybody and it's really brought to the forefront the need to con consolidate our student services, including counseling and mental health support in one area. In order to make that happen, we have to move a few things around in the building uh, to accomplish that goal, which also include, includes the uh, relocation of the main office and nurse's office suites to make them more centrally located in the center of the building. We're also trying to create uh, academic support and co-curricular activities and event space, collaborative learning space. You saw the artistic, uh, the architectural rendering for the new concourse that'll connect uh, House 1 and House 2, but it'll also serve a dual purpose in expanding the cafeteria, just not I mean, in, as well as its intended purpose of increasing pedestrian traffic flow between the buildings. We'll improve cafeteria dining by increasing the ability to serve more than 312 students, as you heard in the video, to also possibly include outdoor space such as the center courtyard, which will now be closed off in terms of safety and security. And then certainly the entire building will be improved as far as special education, photography, musical performances, even this auditorium. There will be acoustical upgrades to improve the dead spots that are here that we have during concerts and musical performances. Uh, we mentioned the office consolidation and centralization, which will bring it into the center of the building near the single point of entry, which we see is very important, as well as the turf field replacement, which I'll speak to in a little more detail this evening. As far as the infrastructure needs, uh, it goes without saying, as you know, we did a, currently a project underway right now that is focusing in on 
Wellwood Middle School, because of its aging infrastructure, believe it or not, as Dr. Kilmer illustrated in the video, the high school infrastructure is not that far behind Wellwood. So certainly there needs to be heating, ventilation, and air, air conditioning improvements in the high school, as well as electrical upgrades. The more that we use technology, security systems, given this day and age, and as we touch all these areas, it'll give us a certain opportunity to replace casework ceilings, lighting, and flooring. Although the lighting that was recently replaced with LED energy efficient lighting from the energy performance contract will remain in place. Believe it or not, a fire lane addition will go around the building. There was a time when uh, state ed did not want to see vehicular traffic flow all the way around schools but in terms of getting emergency apparatus to every location around a building, a school building that is, there will be a fire lane addition on uh, the one side, west side of the building of the high school. Asphalt replacement will continue. As you know, we did a lot of work on Pride Lane as part of our uh, transfer to capital project, and certainly the asphalt replacement will be finished off as we complete all that work to the front of the building, including uh, a new entrance. As far as project timing, the scope of the work is a result of the last building condition survey, which occurred in 2015. We are scheduled for the next building condition survey in 2023. Back in 2015, they identified over $120 million worth of work in all buildings on our campus. So while we've tackled some big projects along the way, our facilities committee, uh, made up of Board of Education members, have been very strategic in trying to chip away at some of the aging infrastructure needs, much like any of us would do with our own home. Part of the timing is because there is debt service that is going to be retired in the 2023 and 24-25 school year. So this will give us an opportunity to capitalize on that retiring debt from earlier projects. There are certain uh, areas of the building infrastructure that are at the end of their useful life. We tried to tackle a lot of that with the energy performance contract, and this will certainly give us an opportunity to address the areas in the high school that were not covered under that initial project. And we expect the construction costs to increase by approximately 3% annually, if not more, given what you've read in the media with the rate of inflation, especially uh, recently as the government tries to navigate its way through the pandemic. Now, one area that we've seen a lot of chatter about on social media as well as the Let's Talk platform is the turf field replacement. There's some misinformation out there, and hopefully we'll try to clarify that with this evening's presentation. We know the existing turf field is at the end of its useful life. It had about a 15-year lifespan, and by the time that it will be replaced, we're already patching certain areas as a result of that. We are seeing increased usage for that by physical education classes, our interscholastic athletic teams, community groups. In fact, uh, one past spring, our athletic director will tell us about even sports such as softball that normally would play on the softball field had to be relocated to the turf field just because their current home field was unplayable because of the water. And then overall, during the past nine months, for example, even with the pandemic, there were 629 events that were held on the turf field. So it is getting constant use throughout the day uh, by physical education classes and by individual community members who are often seen walking the track. Now, contrary to what's out on social media, the estimated field replacement is about $652,000. And believe it or not, this will be covered by building aid, which will cover about 80% of that because we are doing work in the high school. If we were not doing work in the high school itself, the adjacent uh, stadium field would not be covered by the aid. But because we are doing the work in the high school, we anticipate about 80% of that 652,000 will be covered. 
So we also will be using a field replacement fund that was established uh, about 10 years ago. Now that was about $101,000 that out of private money that was set aside in a trust and agency account here that we have been stewards of. But if you take a look at what about 20% of that figure is, that there is not that much of a difference between what money was set aside over a decade ago to cover the local share that's needed. So I wish I could predict uh, in terms of 10 years down the road. So certainly that private money that was set aside will serve a good purpose in defraying uh, um, the most of the local share for that. The difference being about $27,000, which will certainly be covered by the capital reserve fund that we have set aside. Next up is Dr. Kilmer to walk us through the conceptual design in terms of some of the needs that the administrators and the faculty have seen at the high school. Dr. Kilmer. Evening, everyone. I'll try to briefly take you through uh, what, what we'll see in, in the high school. And again, remember, this is conceptual. Some individuals have had some really specific questions about some nitty-gritty design work, and we're not there yet. So again, remember this is big, big picture. So first, to give you, again, um, a general framework of Fayetteville Manlius High School, we need to remember that we're living and working in a facility that was never designed to be one building. House two, which is at the far left of the screen, closest to 173, uh, 173 was actually opened in September of 1962 and that was built as the high school. The portion from the auditorium to your right is house one. And house one was built and designed as a middle school shortly thereafter. And then at some point, a little bit later down the road, we added some connecting corridors and turned it into a single building. And so part of what we're trying to address here is addressing the inadequacies when you try to bring two completely different facilities and make them one. So the scope of work, we're talking about that student commons cafeteria expansion, and you'll see that in the green, and, and I'll, I'll go through these in a little bit more detail and a little bit more um, focused pictures as we go along as well. Collaborative learning spaces, house one and house two connection, uh, a main elevator in the center part of the building. Right now we have elevators in far reaches of the building, which makes accessibility difficult in some cases. Uh, it takes a great deal of time to get from one side of the building to the other. A technology addition, the main office consolidation, uh, a new and improved and larger learning support center, which is an opportunity for students to engage with teachers during study halls, lunch periods, to get additional help throughout the school day. Uh, auxiliary gym, photography lab, student services, and of course the classroom finishes that Dr. Tice talked about, and of course our HVAC upgrades. And this is uh, the second floor of the full building, what, that, what again that, that looks like uh, at the second floor level. To get a little bit more focused in, and you look at the center part of the building, The work in the center part of the building includes a number of items. One, consolidation of offices. Right now in the high school, we have a house one office, we have a house two office, we have an SAO office, we have a student services office, and we have a principal's office. And then we have a nurse's office, which is in the far side of the building in house two. And so we're spread throughout the building. Um, and so it takes some maneuvering to get access to some of those facilities. And many of them are pretty far away from the main entrance, which is where you entered today. We need to find a way to find some efficiencies where we bring offices together, but more importantly, by doing so, accessibility to students and to families is improved. We're looking for an opportunity to make it easy to access all of the services that are available here at Fayetteville Manlius High School and make them easily accessible from the point of entry in that center part of the building. The nurse's office, being at the center part of the building, is essential to access students not only in house one classrooms, but also house two classrooms, but also, again, easy access for parents when they're picking up um, from the house one security office. 
In addition to not only consolidating those offices, we're also going to be able to consolidate mental health and counseling services into the larger House One addition, which is right when you walk in the building, that little jut out there, that's the counseling suite, and then also House One. That allows us to bring our two psychologists into that same counseling suite, as well as bringing our family school liaison into that suite as well. So again, it increases accessibility for students and their services all into one area. This is the second floor letter uh, um, image of that kind of connecting corridor and expansion of the cafeteria or student commons area. If you have had children come through at Fayetteville Manlius High School, or if you yourself came through Fayetteville Manlius High School, you know that, making from house one to house two, you have to actually exit the building to re-enter the building. Entering and exit the building over and over again between periods is absolutely a security concern. And we shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, in this day and age, in December, January, and February, be expecting our students to be traipsing outside to make it from one class to another. This allows us to really unify and connect house one and house two to make it more efficient for students to make it from one side of the building to the other. But again, more importantly, it provides a unification hub that really makes the building feel more connected for all. This is a, a rendering, and again, if you didn't notice when you first came in, there's a number of large signs right when you walk in the door. A number of these images, larger images, are out there for your review as well. And again, this is just conceptual, of course. Over in house, so this is house two, again, closest to 173, just to get your orientation together. And in the house two side, we have the technology addition, so that lower left-hand corner shows you where we would be adding an addition to what is now the science wing. Uh, the science wing and math wing is the lower level. Uh, that area would allow us easy access to bring vehicles in for auto tech, but also easy accessibility uh, for our students. It also would be designed for the curriculum at hand. Again, in the video, I talked about the current classroom that we're using was designed in the 1950s constructed in the early, late 50s, early 60s for 1960s curriculum in mind. We no longer offer many of those classes. We need a facility that's designed for the curriculum of the 21st and future. Uh, in addition to house two, we're talking, one major component of course is the HVAC upgrades. So all of house two is designed with its own system. So we're gonna to need to update all HVAC that would also include air conditioning and of course heating. Um, and so those upgrades would of course touch every single classroom space. So there's a, asbestos abatement, there's ceilings works, there's lighting work, there's flooring work. Uh, so there's quite a bit of work ultimately in house two that will need to be a part of this project. And this is the um, second floor, again, at the bottom of this diagram, you'll notice some lightly green shaded spaces. Those lightly green shaded spaces are what is currently the nurse's office, my office, the house two office, and student activities office. This will allow us to convert those into additional classroom spaces over in house two, which will actually be essential for us when we get into phasing, which I'll talk briefly about as well. So again, the, the high school as a whole, of course, there's HVAC across the board. So we, again, we have house two HVAC replacement, house two air conditioning, house one air handling unit replacement, electrical re panel replacement, house two boiler replacement, which again, our uh, original 1960s vintage, lighting replacement with LED for those areas that have not already been touched as a result of the previous project, ventilation system upgrades, and of course, aging rooftop unit replacements, meaning some of those HVAC rooftop units. There is some additional site work that needs to be done. I don't know how well you can see all of this, but Dr. Tice briefly mentioned a couple of these items. At the lower part of the building, you'll notice that lightly shaded line. That would be the new fire lane 
that would go around the entire part of the building. Again, we have the technology addition. That again, in the top right-hand um, part. And then in the middle, you've got the cafeteria addition. And then again, the lightly shaded area up on top left is the concrete. Um, when you walked in, I don't know if you noticed, I know it's a little dark outside, but the concrete around this campus is in serious need of repair. Uh, and so that work would also be a part of that as well. Security, uh, secure existing courtyard connection to the cafeteria. So that would provide us with an opportunity for space for not only students eating in the cafeteria, but also uh, outside classroom space. So we're excited about that as well. Entrance upgrades. Um, again, temporary modular uh, classrooms, that will be behind the building. Uh, there are some tennis courts and basketball courts there. On the basketball courts that are closest to the high school is where those modulars would be placed. Turf replacement, and then again, the asphalt replacements that Dr. Tice mentioned. So phasing, the preliminary phasing plan shows an approximate 44 months of duration. Now, Anytime you're talking about a project of this size, we're always most concerned about its impact on instruction. And so we have to be very strategic to ensure that it does not have a negative impact on instruction. And so working very closely with the project managers, we've started to come up with what that may look like. Again, the duration is intended to minimize the impact on the learning process and a significant portion of this work we expect would be completed within the first two years of the project. And of course, as I stated before, we would use those modular classrooms behind the building as swing space in addition to those three new classrooms that we would construct as a result of moving and consolidating the offices that would provide us additional flexibility when we're talking about phasing. And a final, more detailed phasing plan will be established once the bidding process is complete and construction contracts are awarded. So lots of different parts of the building require lots of different phasing. Um, and we have to be very strategic in what that will ultimately look like again, because we want to make sure that we can get the project done in a timely manner, but again, not have a negative impact on student learning throughout this time. So in September 23, fall winter 23, modular classrooms come in, completion of new technology, main office suite during the first phase, that will open up some of those areas to add additional classrooms, which will help with that swing space. Summer 23 to fall winter 24, concentrate summer work in science rooms since they would not be transferring well to those swing spaces. Complete necessary asbestos abatement in summer to the extent that are possible to accommodate work throughout those areas since we don't want to be doing that work with students present. Utilizing swing space to methodically move students in first and second floor to ensure, uh, again, we're not involving students and of course, um, not impacting instruction. 24. Exterior pathway at the back of the building. I don't know that you can see it very well, but there's a faint red line at the very top of that image. Um, we're gonna have to, at some point, close down the overpass and underpass so that we can construct that major, th major thoroughfare. The thought process right now is, is that we start that work in the spring and hopefully conclude that work so that students can remain passing uh, in the building before the winter months. And so uh, they may pass outside in that faint red line on top uh, in the spring, and then for a short period of time in the fall. Uh, but again, that would come more detail once we have more uh, specific designs. And again, the goal would again be to provide that interior pathway between house one and house two come late fall of 24. Renovate the existing cafeteria, and again, finish that in the summer of 24, again, with the hope uh, that we'd have the majority of that work done, put up a partition so we can complete that work, so again, there's no interruption to services to students and our staff. 
And then 24, 25, we have a number of additional areas uh, focused specifically on, on HVAC that we would be able to do outside of the scope of having impacts on students. And then moving into House 1 and Music Auditorium Wing upgrades in 25 and fall of 26. Mr. Furlong, off to budget. Thank you, Dr. Kilmer, and good evening, everybody. So in reviewing the, the cost information, uh, the total project cost is $52 million. And basically, uh, you know, a lot of that cost is tied to the duration of the project. We're looking at, you know, 44-month duration. Uh, you know, when you look at the signature portions of this project, they're really to improve the educational uh, program that we offer here at FM. You know, when you break down the cost, about 52% is related to enhancing those educational programs. When you look at the uh, HVAC costs, that amounts to about 29% of the overall cost. And the uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing is about 9%. When you look at the site work, you're about 7.5% of the total cost, and as Dr. Kilmer mentioned before, the vast majority of that is really related to repaving driveways, parking lots, and replacing sidewalks that are in dire need of replacement. When you look at the uh, uh, overall project budget, uh, we are planning, because of the length of the project, of building escalation into that uh, cost uh, escalation at about four and a quarter percent per year. And the project timing, uh, as uh, Dr. Tice mentioned, really coincides with uh, debt that is being retired, which will help you know, with offsetting the uh, tax impact as well. So the financial impact, uh, once again, $52 million. Uh, we do receive New York State building aid, which is a little bit more than 80%. Uh, that percentage aid is paid not only on principal, but interest payments as well. Uh, we are utilizing uh, $7.2 million in a capital reserve that was established by voters back in 2017. Uh, the nice thing about the capital reserve is basically New York State is going to pay us building aid as if we borrowed the entire 52 million. But we're not, we're only gonna be borrowing 44.8 million. So uh, we really see a financial benefit there. The bond issue will be over 15 years, uh, the reason being that New York State will pay us the aid over 15 years because most of the cost of this project is renovations. If most of the cost was additions, then they would be aiding us over 20 years, and then it would be a 20-year bond issue. Right now, we're estimating an interest rate of 2.5%. Uh, interest rates are historically low. Um, when we're financing the, the remainder of the Wellwood project, we went out for a bond anticipation note of $25 million uh, within the last year. The interest rate was 0.16%. So we anticipate that we can do much better than the 2.5% that we're using for this calculation. So what is the uh, estimated tax levy increase? And just to define it, tax levy is really the total amount of dollars that the district will be um, looking to, to take in in their tax levy. The tax rate is really what individual taxpayers pay. Uh, so right now we're estimating conservatively that the tax levy increase will be 1.89%. Now, for the sake of this presentation, we're anticipating that the rate will also increase by 1.89%. So what does that mean? Uh, on the taxable value of $100,000, we're looking at the tax rate going, or tax amount going up a little bit under $48. Now, the one thing to stress here is that since this project duration is almost four years, the financing of that project will also be over four years. So we really anticipate that the average annual increase each year for four years is really a little bit less than $12 uh, 
on $100,000 of taxable value. It's also important to note that these estimates are conservative. Uh, if we see, um, you know, right now the estimates are based upon 1% growth in our tax base, we would anticipate we're gonna get bigger growth than that, and therefore that might offset a large portion of that tax rate increase. Uh, it's also important to note that the impact will not affect taxes until the 24-25 school year. So it's really a few years out from today. When uh, voters go to the polls next Tuesday, uh, there will be one proposition for the entire project. And really what they're authorizing is three things within that one proposition. One is that the total cost will be $52 million. And regardless of how the bids come out, we cannot exceed that $52 million. The second thing they're authorizing is the use of the $7.2 million in the capital reserve. You know, when capital reserves, they need two votes. One is to establish the reserve, which happened back in 2017. This vote will authorize the use of that reserve for this project. And the third thing that this vote would be authorizing is the district to borrow the difference, or the $44.8 million. So what are the other financial implications of this project? We do see anticipate some savings. Um, you know, because of the age of our infrastructure, there's a lot of maintenance costs that are involved. Uh, we do have a uh, fairly sizable uh, annual service agreement with our heating and ventilation systems that we feel that once we put in new equipment, we can drop those service agreement costs and also re reduce the amount of repair and maintenance costs that we incur on an annual basis. Uh, we also believe that with newer equipment, you know, when you look at the size of the boilers that were in the video, uh, the size of the boilers nowadays are far smaller, far more energy efficient. So we're anticipating that this would also generate savings on utilities. Uh, building aid, once again, I mentioned this before, is really based on the total project cost, uh, and the state will pay us for principal and interest. However, because we're using the uh, capital reserve, we will not need to borrow as much as they're going to pay us. Uh, interest rates, as I mentioned before, are currently at historical low levels, and we do have a very strong bond rating. Uh, we have probably one of the highest bond ratings uh, of any school district upstate. And then last but not least, um, you know, really the tax rate estimate right now is based upon minimal growth in the tax base. But we really feel that if you look at their tax uh, levy increase over the last few years as compared to the tax rate increase, while we've seen some levy increases in the 2 to 3 percent range, the tax rates have actually gone down each year for the last three or four years. And that's really because of growth in the tax base. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Tice. Thank you, Mr. Furlong. So the vote will take place, as you can see, and voter qualifications are listed there. You have to be a resident, district resident, for at least the past 30 days, a United States citizen, at least 18 years of age, and no other disqualifying events. We will adhere to COVID protocols during the vote location, much like we did last year. The district clerk will be presiding at FAL. The elementary school will be on remote instruction that day for safety and security while the vote's being held. Absentee ballots are available. In fact, if you need to see the district clerk, she is waving in the front of the auditorium to request an absentee ballot. If the ballot's to be mailed, you can see the um, information there and it will be available and you can speak with her this evening for any clarifications. At this time, we will open it up to any questions from the audience. Yes. Hello? Hello? I can, 
Okay. Um, thanks for that comprehensive presentation. Uh, I'm new to this, so if I ask a, one or two uh, silly questions, please forgive me. Uh, the past nine months, there were 627 events uh, held at the state at the uh, turf field. Were any of those revenue generated, generating, and could they be? That's the first question. Fifty years ago, I came here, and I've been <laughs> wondering why there's such a persistence, a, a resistance to a pool. Was there ever a pool thought of? Even with a $120 million option back five years ago? Just a question, perhaps rhetorical. Sure. <laughs> um, but it's a glaring um, absence here. Any theater backstage tech upgrades? Not just acoustics, but modern stuff back there. And I heard the, the statement made that much of the cost is associated with the duration of the project. Could you be more specific there? Is, is it because that has to be uh, elongated, extended, that it costs more? Okay, certainly. First question in terms of events on the turf, are they revenue generating? We do charge admission for some sporting events such as football, and that goes back to the general fund. So we do some uh, revenue generating. Second question was, you're gonna have to help me back through. Well, it was one about the pool. The pool, we did not at this point in time consider that given uh, the work that needs to be done. We talked about it briefly, but it was uh, a big ask at that point. So we've tried to be mindful. One of the things we've been strategic about, and it's a great question, is the maximum cost allowances. So a pool would count as two teaching stations, I think in our earlier discussions. So it has to be figured in in terms of what the state calls building aid units. We kiddingly joke, we call them children, but it would count as a teaching station for physical education. So we're just be, being very mindful of what would generate aid and what would not generate aid. So at this time, that was something we did not pursue in terms of trying to get other work done. And then the tech, the tech upgrades back in the back. Some of that tech upgrades have occurred already, and you want to speak to that? Uh, within the last 10 years, um, all of the audio was upgraded. We upgraded the entire backstage lights with LED. The ones above us that are directing towards the stage are all LED, so that was relatively new. There are some significant upgrades. This gigantic hole above you, which is the acoustical um, black hole, as my music colleagues like to call it. It just sucks all the sound directly out of the facility. That's a huge issue when this was constructed, that, that was constructed that way. So that's one of the main areas that we're looking to try to redress in this. And my business manager reminded me we do charge outside groups for use of the stadium, such as marching bands and preparation for state competition at the Dome. We do charge those groups. Anything else on that? Those were good questions. I realized halfway through I should have been writing them all down as you were <laughs> reading them off your phone, so well done. Other questions? I only have one part. I saw that the fire loop around the building, which I applaud as a member of the department, has the fire chiefs and the police looked at that? No disrespect to any planners or engineers or architects, but they don't drive fire trucks, they don't drive ambulances, they don't drive police cars. Have you done and sent that to the departments to look at? Well, thank you, Mayor. As you know, uh, we have done tabletop exercises and invited them there at the district. Right now, this is in just conceptual design. Okay. So we still have to vet it through schematic design, design development, and then construction documents. And through that whole process, we will be involving the experts, whether it's faculty members that teach in a particular area, whether it's outside agencies such as the fire department to weigh in on that. 
Um, so as we go through the process, right now, it's the 30,000 foot view of the project. I just bring that up because uh, like ambulance stretchers, when you do the elevators, you know, if it doesn't fit, and people laugh, there's facilities that our ambulance stretchers do not fit in. Mm -hmm. So, and then I know Wellwood, there was a design in the nurse's office where the wheelchair couldn't get out of the door. So I just want to make sure those things are looked at because those are expenses that we bear when we make mistakes in the uh, engineering and architectural part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I do have to say that I came here ready to uh, look at a few things, but you have softened me. Um, question number one, is there anything about a library in any of these plans? For the high school, the yes. library was already addressed uh, in this project that's underway now, phase 1A, we called okay. it. Okay, so I kind of take exception to money being spent on a library when we spend $3.3 million for a library in Manlius and in Fayetteville, three miles apart. So now we have spent money on a library here because nobody wants to drive three miles down the road. That money could have been saved. In your reserve budget, you're gonna use $7.2 million. How much money is in the reserve at this time? 7.2. That's it? For the current reserve, yeah. So For capi no, capital reserve. So there's no other slush fund, as I call it, a slush fund? There's no more money? There are a number, and it's all part of our annual audit, there are a number of different separate reserve accounts that have to be established by the Board of Education or through a public referendum in which money can be deposited. As far as unencumbered, unappropriated fund balance, it can be a, ma a maximum of 4% for emergency projects and things of that nature. And that'll continue over coming years? Yeah, then that's all transparent as part of our annual budget. So there might be audit. more money in that account to offset the tax increases. One of the things that trouble me, now I'm only 35 years old, <laughs> not near retirement, but there are people in Manlius that are in their 70s and 80s, okay? Um, and they're not eligible for uh, the advanced STAR because if you make over a household income of $36,000, you're not eligible for any of that. And we're professionals out here. We do pretty good. We're, we live out here for our kids to come to FM um, to have good homes. Um, but that's going to be a problem. Your budget this year and I t took exception to that it was touted as it was a 0.35 decrease in the tax base. That's deceiving because it was a $5.8 million increase. So I, when I moved here, built the house in 2001, I think it was, the budget was $51 million. Now it's $93 million. How in the world do expenses go up in 5.8 million in one year? Especially when I look at that, your employees, salaries, 401ks, blah, 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 is 71% of the budget. Probably pretty much stuck with that in the future. And now you're talking about increasing your facilities and you're saying that we're gonna save money on maintenance and probably repairs, yes, um, but you're gonna have to hire more people. Probably the average person, once you get done with all your payroll taxes and everything, you're talking about $50,000. So your taxes are gonna to continue to go up. Now, the pictures that I've seen, I've softened because we do need upgrades here. Um, I think that the way this country tend to, tends is, let's put everything in there, okay? And it, it's cheaper now. Well, the construction materials might not be more expensive in three years from now, okay? It might, they might be less. Your interest rates, if we have interest rates at 1.89% five years from now, I think you're dreaming, okay? And this budget shouldn't go over what it says and you're gonna end up having to cut it. 
But what really motivated me, and then I'll go away, this turf thing really just, just sticks in my craw. We voted this thing down three times. Three times. You almost had to go on an austerity budget. And the Einstein that stuck that in this budget, I hopefully is going to be your Achilles heel to your vote because hardly anybody's here. And that's all they're going to see. You had funds, private funds, built it. We told you years ago that we are going to get stuck with this when it comes a time to replace it. Yes. You said that we'd save on maintenance costs. Where did that money go? You spend it on something else, just like I do. Okay? If this thing, this stadium has revenue, then that should be in the fund. I don't care if it's 652000 or a million six hundred fifty-two thousand. The taxpayers should not have to fund a new field every eight years, ten years. Just shouldn't do it, and it shouldn't be in the budget. You should pull it out. Thank you. Other questions. Um, one of my uh, questions was about the, uh, the, the timing of this, because uh, you guys, is, uh, um, we've uh, talked, and in, in you guys have said that the board has been discussing it for mm -hmm. the last four meetings, and you guys put the signs up, and that's the first time that I've seen it. I'm like, oh, there's a, there's a vote coming up for a capital project. What is it? And this is probably the first that most people have you know, seen, maybe, I can't say most, but a good percentage of the people, the day before this meeting or the day of this meeting. And in this, I've read it through, a lot of the stuff you've just uh, said it in much the same terms in different articles, but there's no mention in this about this meeting. I mean, it's not on the front page. There's an informational meeting to be scheduled six days or seven days before this vote. I mean, how does that happen? I mean, can you explain how you expect the public to know of what's going on in the school, what you guys are proposing? Because I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not against it. I'm just, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. my first question is how do you how do you justify the limited information in a, such a quick vote? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, just, I've got. A, I've got. I don't want to cut you off. I've got I'm a, sorry. A, a, I just a, yeah. a, a couple of questions. So I'm just certainly uh we've been discussing this for a number i mean since the spring the facilities committee has been reporting out at the board of education meetings with updates about what our short-term and long-term plans are so if you go back into the minutes you will note that we've talked about the current project that's underway that's under budget and ahead of schedule but we've also been talking about the next phase in the project in terms of what the needs are and the high school in terms of its aging infrastructure being next in line in terms of replacements and upgrades. Now, to go to your question about the newsletter, we plan that in advance. We've shared with the local media in terms of the, tonight's meeting. Uh, some of the media has put it in the paper already, such as the Eagle Bulletin. Others, the TV channels, are interviewing uh, Dr. Kilmer and I later in the week. 
So we've really tried to advertise the vote and the informational meeting uh, up front in terms of getting it out, not just on our website, as we've discussed, but as well as other venues. So, so you feel that you did an adequate job and it's not a rush? Yeah, very, no, it's not a rush. It's similar to what we did in 2017. We often do a winter vote because it takes about a year to send this through facilities planning at state ed. We want to go out in the winter in terms of our bidding documents. In fact, back when we voted in 2017, we went out with the uh, bids in December of 2018, and the bids were very favorable for the district. Uh, so we want a winter bidding climate. So we, in 2017, just like now, we hit December. In fact, in 2017, it was December 5th, I think, was the vote. So we want the bids to come in in the winter when the contractors are hungry and ready to look ahead to plan for their summer work the year ahead. Which is then going to be phased out in the next four years. So you're going to hold the bidders that are bidding now to their contract that they're going to do mm -hmm. in three to four years to the dollar. Just like they do now. Yeah. In 2018, we held them to it. It cannot be a penny more. Very good. Is there any change to the, f you guys are, pro are proposing this a lot of good seating, more seating for the cafeteria, and I, uh, and I uh, uh, applaud it because there is not enough room in the cafeterias for all the kids to eat. But can they get through the lines in that time? I mean, is there any changes to the food distribution? Been a while since I've been up here, class of uh, 87, there was one door to come in and then it split out on two ends. Is it the same? I mean, I'm, I'm just not. So, no, know, this is the, it, it's a good question. So, um, if the voters approve and we move forward with the project, the expanding seating for use for the cafeteria. So, again, I see that as much more as just a cafeteria. I see it being used yeah, yeah. instructionally, after school, lots of different things. However, it opens up the door when you were talking about lunch. Um, so what it allows us to do is to creatively look at our entire master schedule and look at completely changing how we schedule students throughout the whole day. Is there a possibility for us to incorporate a lunch slash activity period in the middle of the day and allow every single student and kind of divide the building in half and feed 700 students at a time while other students are able to engage in, in clubs or other pieces. Again, that's a bigger conversation to have with the faculty and students about what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. But that addition allows us to, to completely reimagine how we schedule all of our students. Um, and then it, it would have to. So it wouldn't be simply we can now seat 700 people and then we're not going to address how it functions. The functionality of it has to evolve with it as well so that it accommodates the number of students that would ultimately be in there. So the $6 million does not incorporate better food distribution? No, it does include some of those pieces. We've actually talked about a couple of those pieces already, but again, that will come to more of the um, schematic design when we get down to the more details once and if the project is approved by the voters. Thank you. You bet. Was there any thought on expanding the vocational classes or adding vocational classes? I mean, when you uh, look at what is being done here, you've got uh, HVAC, you've got construction, you got electricians, you've got uh, masons. I mean, all of these vocational workers, people that, you know, didn't really go to college, but they went to a trade school, maybe. I mean, I think uh, King and King and I, I'm not sure who you guys are from. 
They're king and king. This is Latrice. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I mean, you I mean, you you guys can speak for the vocational, and I see that there's a new tech and and or the realignment of the tech in a new auto shop in a moving over the photo lab, but what about, have you given any thought to vocational learning for our students instead of pushing them or guiding them into a, 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 a four-year school? Um, so the technology addition would absolutely accommodate and address some of the things I think you're talking about. When it comes to the courses we offer at the high school, we have always been focused on what are students interested in and then how do we find a way to offer that. So I build the master schedule every year based on what students request, what do they want to take. So the number of sections we offer, the number of courses that we offer is all driven by student desire. Have you and we you? talk as departments every year. We like right now we're just finishing up the course catalog for next year. So we'll be printing that at the end of this month. But one of the things that we talk about with every department, which is are our current course offers, offerings serving the needs of our students right now? What else do students want? What else could we possibly do? This expansion opens up the door curricularly in the technology department specifically for more uh, different types uh, of courses to be offered. But again, we really allow students, and again, those conversations with students about what are the things that students are interested in and what else should we be, be offering. And then part of that is also what's going on in the world, what's going on around us in the local economy, the state economy and the national economy, what are some additional things, skills that students need that maybe we can offer here? Um, and then it's also a balance between what we can offer here well versus what BOCES offers very well for us as well. I mean, when you say what the students are requesting, I'm just wondering, uh, have you offered uh, any of the construction firms to um, during the college college days to set up a table and so they're actually construction days that our students actually go to uh, that BOCES uh, actually helps and sponsors and we actually bring students there so there are a number of other venues that we look so for to bring, try to bring in some expertise outside of our own so you bring them to the BOCES for those classes no I'm, I'm sorry I might, I might have so there has been for years it's, it's been a couple of years now but just for instance, you were talking about construction trade. There is a really large um, offering that BOCES sponsors. Mm -hmm. It's typically out the New York State Fairgrounds. Uh -huh. And that brings together a large number of trades that gives students the opportunity to kind of connect and learn more. And so we continue to look for other opportunities where we can do that internally as well. Okay. Um, the for the uh, the hundred and one thousand dollars that was set aside for the turf replacement, how much interest did uh, did that accrue in the ten years? How much? How much? Just a couple of thousand. Two. Who the heck is doing your investments? It's a trust and agency account. It's held. An escrow, basically. Here's a thought. Rethink that. Jeez. Is that is that what it is? Like you're pretty sure, or? I don't have an exact number. I have to look it up. But it wasn't a lot. Not like it's double. No. 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 Of course, it wouldn't double, but sure, doubling is. In the last ten years, absolutely, that should be double. It's. If you invest. Huh? Absolutely. If you're making but 10 the days year, you're making 10 grand a year. Districts cannot arbitrage. They cannot borrow at a lower rate and then turn around and put the money out. That that was do something different. If, if I ran my business like you run your business, I'd be out of business. But our our business is regulated. I don't know about your business, but your our business, business is regulated. Is, is to have, I don't have any problem with any of these classrooms or 
any of the things that have to do with education and better the kids. But, but this, this is baloney. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I think it's my last question. I know I've had a lot, but that's, in, that's my nature. In any case, um, about the, uh, the parking and the asphalt construction, I know that um, over at uh, Eagle Hill, that circle that they had that went into their auditorium, whoever paved that, whoever constructed that, whoever designed that, didn't really think about the, the trucks going in, so they had to redo it. And the same with the latest parking lot that you guys did in front of the uh, turf field. They had that little alcove. You guys wound up having to take that out. And still, the one parking space is very narrow for two cars in order to try and get out because, I mean, it's, it's really designed very poorly. I mean, have, did we, the district, have to pay to get those corrected? Or did the contractor correct it because it was a bad design? And if we had to pay it, is that somehow going to be fixed in the new, when you guys start doing the new paving that you find out, oh, bad, bad design, you guys are going to have, I mean, I guess the question is, who paid to fix that? And it still needs to be fixed because the one parking spot, you drive in, you try and drive out, and there's not two lanes, and there's not a one to Well, there shouldn't. Out. First of all, uh, that parking lot was reconfigured. It's prior to my arrival here, but they removed the original entrance and reconfigured the high school in front of house two because of line of sight issues. Yep. with the knoll at Enders Road. Yep. So I know the DOT was involved back then. That all was reconfigured. And then you're right, the district office parking lot was reconfigured to try to include as much staging area for parents to be able to drop off the children in the morning and to pick up the children uh, at the end of the day. So what you're talking about closest to the turf field is really the parking area for the district office. And it is, it is functional for district office employees. Where it becomes problematic that you're referring to is if we have people sneaking in there to try to pick up children when they should be going through the parent pick up and drop off loop that it was designed for. So you're right, sometimes it seems like it's too narrow for the vehicular traffic flow, but they shouldn't be pulling in there. We put signage up that indicates it's district office parking only. Have you ever been there during a football oh, game? Oh, absolutely. Car pulls in to see if there's a parking spot. And they're, the parking and they're parking on the sidewalk in the fire lane, and no, they're well, going to get towed. I'm talking yeah. about that first set that's yeah. right in front. You got the sidewalk that divides it, and there's not an entrance out, so cars at one time, in at, there. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. At one time, we used to cone it off. Uh, and direct everybody to the back parking lot to come down the hill. And, and you we don't may think do that's that again. A bad design? No, I think we should cone it off for the emergency vehicles, for the ticket booth that's right there. I think we should go back to coning it off, is my personal opinion. So, in, uh, on the well, would you have modular um, classes that you guys in this newsletter said that you guys can use for this new? but you're still including 500,000 for those modular classes? We have to dismantle the modular classrooms from uh, Wellwood, they're on tractor trailers, and then bring them over to the high school site. So there would be a cost, even though we own them, they will have to be dismantled and then uh, hooked, reassembled at the new site. 500,000, a half a million dollars? I don't know, is that what it is? How much did it cost to buy them? So, 
That's a, it's a shocker. I mean, half a million dollars to plumb them, transport them, set them up. So the cost to rehab the basketball courts and the dismantling at the end is also incorporated in that 500000 Correct. And the tennis courts at Wellwood, as you probably know, were in need of repair anyhow. Yes. So, yes. And it all has to okay. be sent through uh, facilities planning at the state. So there's nothing we're doing with those modulars that state ed doesn't know about. And... Um, if, if I wanted to know before the vote, because like, you have for the, the photo lab and the, tech, and the technical lab being like $2.6 million when from the diagram, which you can't read on, in here or on there, but from there you, you could kind of, it's like moving right across the way for $2.5 million. Is there a way to get a detail to find out exactly what you guys are foreseeing being the two, 2.6? It is the photo lab and auxiliary, I'm sorry, photo lab and auxiliary gym of 2.1, I'm sorry, 2.1 million dollars I mean I just I'm just wondering what seeing that there's already a photo lab and there's already a, a space that the wood shop is taking up now which is not a wood shop anymore which we can agree to disagree and then there's another space right next to it and they're basically moving from one to the other so I'm just trying to figure out where we're that 2.1, so if I, would you guys be able to break that down on exactly what? Yeah, we can set some time up to sit and you know, talk through that, but they are being moved in order to consolidate the main office and the nurse's office. Right, for 2.1. Yep. Okay, and is there any reason why the breakdown of the cost summary wasn't, you know, given out, at least here, or part of the newsletter or anything like that for maybe give again to my first question gives the public more information than you have at this point they're just estimates they're based on the conceptual design there will be more detailed estimates as we go along in the process finally culminating with the bid documents where the contractors will bid against themselves in order to get the work. So right now, these are just placeholders as we estimate what the worst case scenario could be. It could very well be, as we've seen at the Wellwood project, be ahead of schedule and under budget. Yeah. And knock on wood, I hope it happens again. Yeah. Well, I uh, thank you all for your uh, time you. and for taking my uh, questions. It Certainly. was a very nice Thank you, uh, presentation. Rob. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? I guess I... I just... Go right ahead. I just have... I don't think I need to come up here. Well, it would help because we're live streaming. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. We're live streaming and it just helps. Okay. Um, I guess I just have a question. Not my children haven't gone through here in quite a while, so I don't believe air conditioning was something at that time. Has there been air conditioning straight along, like in the past couple of years, or is this a new additional thing to the high school? How, do you want to handle it? Or House One has had the air conditioning. Some areas at Eagle Hill have had air conditioning. 
Uh, Ender's Road is one of the newest buildings in the fleet, so to speak. It is air conditioned. So it's a matter of trying to provide the equity throughout the entire district, again, doing it in a systematic piece by piece way. But some buildings are haves and others are have nots. So Mott Road? Mott Road presently does not, but we're trying to look at that in the future along with Fayel because they have already been upgraded to the energy efficient boiler. So it would be easier and especially using the federal stimulus money, which can be earmarked for improving ventilation systems in schools, especially since the pandemic. We're looking at air conditioning as well as ultraviolet uh, radiation to kill any bacteria in the system. Okay, that was it. Thank you, great question. I'm a little afraid to ask this question after the other answer. The $7.2 million reserve fund, how is that invested? It is a reason you want to. We, uh, we keep our money in either uh, money markets, uh, predominantly, there's probably about 95 plus percent of our money is held in money market accounts. You know, currently those rates are like very low. We might be talking four or five basis points. While you might be able to get better investment rates out in the real world, as I call it, uh, we have to have 105% of our deposits are collateralized. The cost of carrying that collateral, because we, we have to have by New York State General Municipal Law we have to have collateral agreements in place with any banking institution we, we deal with. And therefore, because they have to be 105% collateralized, there's a cost to doing that. And that's really why we get very low rates. Um, you can go back 20, 25 years ago, I can remember getting certificate of deposit rates six, six and a half for a year. Um, but unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. You know, we started to see rates go up, you know, uh, prior to the pandemic, where we were getting, you know, maybe one and a half to two percent, which was like we had died and went to heaven. Um, but then as soon as the pandemic hit, the rates just fell through the basement again. Not that I understood the first part about this collateralized, but are you forced? Is that the only way you can invest $7.2 million? We... Once again, we have to follow general municipal law. So we can only invest really in, you know, time deposits, money market, certificates of deposit. We can use treasuries. Uh, we can go with treasuries, but typically to get a fairly high rate, you're going to have to go out beyond a year to two years. Um, but basically, uh, once again, what really hurts us is the fact that uh, we have to have that collateralization in place because it is public money and therefore uh, there's a cost of doing that, you know, related to whatever banking institution we're using and therefore they, they deduct that from our rates. So our rates that we're getting are very low. I, I would say so. And, and, yeah. and personally, since it's all our money, mm -hmm. okay, I think you, we made a mistake in 2017 of, of creating this, this slush fund. Because if that's what you're doing with our money to help offset our taxes, you're a lot smarter than I am, but you're failing, okay? So get rid of this thing, if that's all you can do. Because my seven-year-old granddaughter can make better money in that. So again, not to be insulting, but if that's what we're doing with our money, you're not, it's, it's not working. How about that? Fair enough. Any other questions?
Mr. Seidberg, I saw your hand up earlier. Anything additional? All right, thank you. to just address one of the questions. I just want to make sure that it's understood that this has been an incredibly deliberative process. This, this district has been talking about this plan going back, not going back, not just the last couple months, several months, but if we remember back to when we did the Wellwood project and all the meetings that were held before the Wellwood project, we talked very clearly that this was going to be a multi-phased plan. There was a lot of debate. I was one of them at the time that wanted to see the whole $140 million project as, as one. And, and it wasn't done that way. It was split up, and it was, it was very clearly communicated back then that there was going to be a phase 1A, 1B, phase 2, phase 3, phase 4 to tackle this hundred-plus million dollar facilities need. And, and that, that we have to remember, this is for our students. You know, we, we, most of us live here because of the schools and the, and the education that our kids receive in this district. Some of our facilities are not to the standards that we need them to be for the educational program that we're delivering to these students. But, but that's been the plan for this to be a multi-phase plan for a very long time. And it's been a very deliberative process. We've spoken about this at length, obviously, at every facilities committee meeting and reported that out at Board of Education meetings. I've been very grateful. One of the very, very few benefits of COVID is that the board meetings have been live streamed. You know, it's very hard for people to come to those meetings. We understand that, but they are all online. They're all live streamed to be watched at convenience. And we've talked about the phasing of these multiple projects and about this particular project going back a very, very long time. So it's I understand it's coming up close now, but, but this, this is not a new topic of conversation in this district. And it is something that involves the one building that every single student in this school district will pass through. This is not Mount Rhoda. I mean, every school is equally important, but this is the one building, the doors through which every student will pass. And, and I hope anybody that has any questions about this takes advantage to go Take a tour through what Wellwood looks like right now. And, and, and the incredible transformation that's been done at that building for the learning spaces for our students. And when this project is done, if the voters do back this, as I hope they do, the transformation of the spaces in which our students will be able to learn going forward for a great many of years will be far better and far more beneficial to their education than what we're able to provide in this building today. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. And to echo your point, it is put forth before all the voters because we know we can't please everybody and it has to be the majority. And we've tried to take a look at it big picture. And we know that there's gonna be some dissenting opinions, but we also know there's going to be some that are thrilled with what's being offered. And that's why we have to put it up for a vote. So your point is well taken. I appreciate it. May I? Sure. Well, I was there at the uh, 2017 um, vote. And I believe it was held in three meetings because it covered the three buildings. And we did a walkthrough especially at Wellwood. And then there was a meeting at Enders Road. And then there also was a meeting at one of the others. Because I, I remember you guys being there, you guys showed us where the uh, uh -huh. elevator goes. What had to transpire to get in Wellwood. So, I mean, there was adequate public notice and adequate time before, since the pub, those public meetings and the vote. That's why I'm so, because you guys did it so well in phase one. And I'm just, and I'm, and I'm just stunned that phase two is not being held, is not being carried to that same standard. And that's why my first question was, I'm, I'm just, I'm per, perplexed. Maybe it was because of COVID, you guys couldn't do the tours, mm -hmm. 
or what, you know, but mm -hmm. it still doesn't explain the quick six days from now we're supposed to vote and this is a public information meeting. And back in 2017, I think you had almost, you had more people at Wellwood. It was a big group. Well, there was a task force because there was a lot of debate in terms of maintaining a presence in Fayetteville and refurbishing the building versus other options that were being discussed in terms of community surveys and things like that. So there, phase one was a tough nut to crack in terms of going into the detail. Phase two, as Mr. Seiberg indicated as chair of the facilities committee, was really discussed back then as the next step in terms of the aging infrastructure. Believe it or not, these boilers are only in single digits, about nine years younger than the Wellwood boilers, oh, yeah. which I, you're right, Rob, when we did those tours, it looked like Mike Mulligan's steam shovel, and it was like, oh boy, we, we yeah. can't wait to, to get the work done at Wellwood because of the fact that there were issues even then at the time. So these boilers are right there. Yeah, I'm sure in terms of. I, I think at, a, <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a, that time, you guys even said they're one of the same uh, generations. But. Yeah, and at that time, we also had yeah. some issues at Wellwood in terms of the boilers malfunctioning. So there was a sense of urgency sure. to be able to get those swapped out. All right. I, I just wanted uh, to. We, appre no, we appreciate the feedback. Thank you. All right, hearing no other questions, we'll bring this informational meeting to a close. Uh, we will encourage you to vote uh, again a week from today uh, from seven in the morning till nine at night at Fayetteville Elementary where our regular budget votes are held as well. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this evening. Thank you. <laughs>